We're running a little bit late. I know it was difficult to find the room. We all faced that same challenge this morning. And I understand that the FDA guys were very popular. So we may see people streaming in, but um, you're here and we're here. So uh, let's get going and we can, we can uh, hopefully open up the Regenerative Medicine Capital Conference. Our goal here for this morning, at least the mandate that Bernie gave us, was to try to introduce uh, new investors and people who are in the field uh, to an overall framework uh, for analyzing investment opportunities in the field of regenerative medicines. The way we're gonna do this is uh, Chris and, and Jane and I are kind of divided into three parts. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about the financing environment in which we find ourselves. Uh, Jane's gonna talk about some biz business issues and Chris is gonna highlight some of the more compelling new technologies and therapeutic applications uh, that are out there being developed right now. So um, we've set it up so that Chris and Jan and I each do about 15 minutes of yakking at you. And, uh, but along the way, all of us are very capable of fielding questions on the run. So if you have any questions while we're going, feel free to put your hand up and just holler. We'll have some time, hopefully, at the end for questions, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take you through a, just a short look at the regenerative medicine market, just some high market metrics to give you a frame of reference for where we are in the field. Uh, then talk about the funding environment, which is quite interesting right now. We're kind of at a inflection point in both the field and in the funding environment, I think. And then I'm gonna spend just a couple seconds talking about the uh, role of translation centers, because in my view, translation centers are really critical to implementing the capital efficient business models that uh, venture capitalists and guys on Wall Street, frankly, are looking for um, if you're gonna try to move a technology forward, okay? So first and foremost, as you all know, I hope, um, regenerative medicine technologies really have finally started to show their promise. That promise is being shown in the first instance um, around cancer immunotherapies and gene therapies. These, these, um, the clinical trials that are being run by the companies pursuing these technologies are demonstrating really remarkable success rates. Success rates, response rates in the order of 70, 80, 90 percent. Uh, Juno, as you probably know, ran a very small trial that had a 100 percent response rate. Um, that's kind of unheard of in drug development. Historically, drugs, as you all know, um, get approved on 25% response rates. So the immunotherapies and gene therapies are leading the charge right now and have kind of captured the imagination of investors in the field and garnered very substantial market caps. Um, there has been a huge flow of capital and interest into the field, and it's driven in part by these technologies. Chris is gonna talk a little bit more about those technologies um, as we move forward. So just overview of the market at a high level. Where are we? Pretty rapidly expanding uh, market right now. Um, you know, how you define the market depends on what you put in the bucket of regenerative medicine. Uh, but by any metric, you're seeing compound annual growth rates above 20% under any analyst that, that I've read in, in the last 18 months. Um, funding has increased pretty dramatically. I'm gonna talk about more specifics on venture funding in just a second. And there is a significant amount of clinical activity, which I think we would all agree is a, one of the best measures of the maturation of a field. Uh, right now, if you went on to clinicaltrials.gov and Googled stem cells, you're gonna get 4,300 hits at least, depending how you define that search, you could narrow that down. But there is a significant amount of activity out there. And uh, interestingly, um, a number of, of late stage trials, 200 to 400 again, depending on how you define stem cells and how the search uh, mechanism you're using. Um, but the point is that there is a very significant amount of clinical activity in the field and that is driving technologies into the market, which creates an environment in which investors would be very interested and are very interested. We'll talk about that in a second. There are a number of commercial products on the market. We have, of course, our first approved gene therapy, uh, 40 plus cell therapies, We've already treated more than a million, million and a half patients, um, and there is significant number of companies being formed. Um, we maintain a company database at Proteus. We've got over 700 companies in, in the database. That includes everybody who touches the field. There are about 300 companies that are focused exclusively, just purely focused on uh, stem cells, gene therapy, cell therapy, uh, kind of the regenerative medicine core technologies. Uh, another metric you could find a number of different reports on how the market's growing. This is just a graphic of that compound annual growth rate demonstrates that the market is really growing. And I, I think this is a conservative estimate. I, I've got actually three or four of these. This is really the low end of the range in terms of compound growth rate. Suffice it to say that the market is really expanding in very real terms. Um, clinical trials are happening worldwide. Again, that's a very good indication of the maturation of the industry. And this is a global 
effort. It's not just happening in the United States or Europe or London. Um, there are 700 companies and they are distributed uh, worldwide. So I think it's fair to say the market really has matured and we are at or beyond a key inflection point in terms of creating value with this technology. Um, so let me turn now to the funding environment. Both Jane and Chris are going to talk a little bit more about the market and about some of those business issues. I want to spend most of the rest of my talk just talking about where we are in terms of raising money. Uh, as you all know, I assume that most of you are investors or folks who are interested in investing. Um, the IPO window has been open since kind of June 2012. It's been an incredible ride for the last two plus years. Um, 2013 and 14 were record years for biotech IPOs. Uh, we had over 108 offerings from then. We've had another 45 plus uh, this year. So we've had a very dramatic increase in the number of uh, companies that have gone public and they've raised huge amounts of money. Um, $7.9 billion raised in public offerings in 2013 and 2014. Uh, these were the best biotech IPO, win this is the best biotech IPO window showing that we've seen in, in the 75 years that biotech has been around. Um, and in 2013, 2014, the companies that went public ended up performing pretty well. Uh, on average, those uh, companies were up 70% beyond their initial pricing. So if you're an investor interested in the field, whether you're buying at the IPO, whether you're a mezzanine investor getting in in a pre-IPO financing, or you buy the next day uh, after the company is already public, uh, at least during the 2013 and 2014 cycle, you were seeing very dramatic returns on your investment in a very short period of time. And you can imagine what that does. That galvanizes a lot of folks who are just looking for opportunities. I mean, if you're out right now in in mutual funds or you're out in a, porf a managed portfolio, your money manager is telling you he's going to get you between 5 and 7 percent. Okay? These companies are up 70 percent in the first three months after they go public. So that is attracting a lot of capital. We've seen a lot of generalist firms and a lot of crossover firms who've gotten interested in the field. So the folks really who've been driving the big dollars into this wave have really not been the historic venture firms that are uh, funding at the early stage and then taking the companies public. Uh, the money is really coming from crossover funds um, and from generalist investors, guys who haven't historically been biotech guys, um, who brought the money into the field because of the very substantial returns that can be generated on the back end. Um, the pace has slowed a little bit in uh, 2015. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the public markets have rewarded the really dramatic dramatic efficacy and uh, technology advances that we've seen by cell and gene therapy companies. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Bluebird, Juno, Kite, and Avalanche story. Uh, Bluebird, Juno, and Kite are all wonderful examples of how dramatically you can create market cap and value if you have a technology that is truly curative. I mean, these technologies, again, 70, 80, 90 percent response rates, you can actually use the C word legitimately when you're talking about 70 or 80 or 90 percent response rates. Avalanche, a little bit more of a cautionary tale. A reminder, Avalanche at one point uh, had a market cap of a billion and a half uh, based on very promising data and then they published uh, trial results that were not as favorable as expected and they kind of they got crushed. So they dropped their, uh, the stock price went from 25 down to nine. Um, the point is that in the markets, if you are posting good numbers and you can demonstrate efficacy, um, particularly in a large market like cancers, um, you're going to be able to uh, generate a very substantial market cap on the order of 2 to $4 billion, as you're seeing from Bluebird and Juno. Okay. Again, 2014 was a great year. Um, 71 offerings raised $5.2 billion. Um, one of the best years in record in terms of uh, biotech IPOs. The um, question is what's happening in 215 and how does that translate into the broader market? Why is that happening? Well, one of the reasons that hap is happening is because biotech is a pretty good place to be, uh, both because we are fundamentally uh, creating real value by bringing technologies through that clinical development cycle. Again, in biotech, value is created <coughs> Excuse me, by moving your technology through the FDA process, right? Um, as you get through the regulatory cycle, you create more value at every step. Uh, and real value is being created. Um, on the other hand, the other, if you're an investor looking for a place to put money, where else are you going to go? 
Um, there aren't any other real opportunities out there that are generating substantial returns, at least not the kind of returns you can get in biotech. As a result, a lot of money has flown into biotech, and this chart, I think, demonstrates pretty graphically what has happened with that. Um, this is the NBI, the biotech index on the NASDAQ. Um, it's outperformed all the other major indices by more than 2x. And uh, the other industries have actually done okay, uh, but the NBI has done very well. Um, unfortunately, we had a correction with the NBI in July, okay? And uh, that correction has translated, and that correction is driven by a number of things, pricing concerns. You guys have all heard about uh, Shrekley and the other folks that are out there. And um, pricing, it's become a political issue. Um, it has driven down the, the valuations of some very big companies. Um, and uh, we've seen a significant drop in the NBI. What that has done is it has impacted uh, the, the biotech IPO activity in 2015. It's cause and effect, not really. The NBI is just tracking what's going on in the field. Uh, but the concern over pricing and the fact that we've seen a decline um, in, in some very large biotech companies, uh, Valiant and Biogen together lost $82 billion this year in market cap. Okay? $82 billion represents more than all of the money that was raised by all of the companies that went public since this biotech window opened up. Okay? So that's a very significant chunk of money. Um, the, the, again, the generalists and crossover investors that were investing in those companies, in the larger biotech companies, have now upside, are now upside down in their portfolios, and so those guys are pulling back, okay? Um, and again, we've got a 25% drop in uh, the NBI since July. Now, it's recovered a little bit in the last couple of weeks, uh, but we are still kind of trending downward for the year. We're actually flat for the year at this point and some concern that it may continue to, to uh, decline. Um, a number of high-profile companies that were, going, uh, were planning to go public have delayed or pulled their IPOs. The issue here, and what I'm driving at, is is this biotech IPO window closing? And if it is closing, is it closing dramatically, or very rapidly, or is it closing slowly? Certainly there has been a pullback, no question about it. We've got a bunch of companies pulling their IPOs, uh, many of the companies, in fact, most of the companies of the 45 companies that have gone public in 2015, most of them, a substantial majority of them came in below the range. So they're out trying to generate the book on their IPO. They, they have articulated a specific pricing range for their stock. If you guys have been through the process, you know how that goes. And then when you list, you find out whether or not that range is realistic or not. Now, some of that has to do with how many times you're oversubscribed and what kind of interest your underwriters have developed in the book. Um, but the reality is, of those 45 companies, most of them ended up pricing at the bottom end or below the stated range. Um, and that suggests that there is a waning interest uh, in biotech IPOs and a closing or certainly narrowing of a window that had been wide open, okay? And unfortunately, also, most of these companies have performed poorly. The median price of the 45 companies that went public uh, this year is down 10% since their initial offering. So if you got in at the IPO price, you've lost money. Last year, you made 70%. This year, you lost 10%, okay? It doesn't take long for people to kind of say, all right, I'm putting the brakes on that strategy. I'm not gonna be chasing uh, biotech IPOs. And so what we're seeing is if you're out there trying to go public right now, uh, the book that you're going to be raising is no longer going to include the big crossover funds or generalist groups. What you're going to be pitching to are the traditional guys who invested in biotech historically. Uh, they're much more sophisticated. They've seen this thing ride up and down, and they're not going to give you the kind of valuations that people were getting last year, and that's why we're seeing this decline. So we're, in some ways, we're coming back to the norm um, it's, it's a natural part of the cycle. I'm not trying to say the sky is falling. I just think we are coming back to the norm. It is not quite as frothy a market as it has been. Um, and again, this year, the pace has dropped kind of dramatically. Now, that's not happening just for us, not just in, in um, biotech IPOs. It's across the board. Um, the IPO market has really declined. Healthcare IPOs in particular, um, that, in, that includes medical devices and uh, biotech information technology and the broad range of healthcare. Healthcare IPOs declined 30% in 2015. Um, 
Here's another way of looking at it. The IPO market right now um, is at its lowest level since 2009. We had a big peak in the 2012, 2000, or 2013, 2014 um, stage, but right now it's dropped down pretty dramatically. Uh, compounding the problem is that uh, some of the traditional uh, regenerative medicine companies uh, have performed very, very poorly in 2015. The immunotherapy companies have done extraordinarily well. The gene therapy companies have done extraordinarily well. Uh, but the companies that had, in years past, been perceived as leaders in the field, Athersis, Mesoblast, um, Neostem is now Calid Caladrius, um, those companies have done very, very poorly in this cycle. Uh, you know, Neostem changed its name to Caladrius. They had disappointing results in their cardio trial, although if you read the underlying data, the results were really not that bad, um, but they got hammered. Their stock dropped from, you know, 417 down to a buck 12. Okay, they lost 70% of their value. Athersis had disappointing results in their stroke trial following disappointing results last year in their um, ulcerative colitis trial with Pfizer, and they got crushed. They went from 327 down to a buck seven. Again, 60 plus, 65% plus drop in value. And Mesoblast um, got crushed not because of a technology issue, because of a business issue. Mesoblast came and listed on the New York Stock, or on the NASDAQ. Um, they had previously, in another incarnation, been dual listed. For those of you who've been in the field for a while, you remember that there was an angioblast company that was a, associated with Mesoblast that was listed on the New York Exchange, while Mesoblast was listed on the Australian Exchange. About five years ago, they delisted on the New York Exchange, folded those companies together, and that was when Mesoblast took its ride from a three or four hundred million dollar company up to a four billion dollar company at its peak. Um, well, they apparently were not able to raise the money they need to continue operations in Australia, so they came to the States and listed in New York and have been absolutely crushed. Um, they've lost 70% or 53% of the value. Uh, it's actually higher than that. Um, you know, they had, if you go back to the origin, back to the peak, off that $4 million high, their market cap now is down to in the high threes, 380 or so. Now, that's more of a business issue than it is a uh, techn underlying technology issue. So, um, so the message there is the IPO window is still open. You can still access the public markets. You can still get capital from the public markets. Uh, but that window is beginning to narrow a little bit, and it is a much tougher game than it was during the last 24 months. Um, on the flip side of the coin is venture capital. If you heard me uh, speak last year when I was presenting this data on the 2012-2013 cycle, the question I was asking is, where is venture? You know, if the, if the IPO markets are doing so well, if people are doing so well in the public markets, where are the venture guys? Uh, well, the venture guys have now come in with a vengeance. They're back. Um, we are at historic levels for investment of venture dollars into biotech. 2014 was the best year in history with raising more than $6 billion in 470 deals. 2015 is on track to surpass that. We're on track to hit $7.5 billion in venture capital invested uh, in biotech this year. Early stage financings, which is really good news because this has been a problem for the field. Early stage financings are very strong right now. There's been a lot of interest in early stage. Back in the 2000 to 2008 cycle, many, many early stage venture firms went out of business. A lot of the money cycled from early stage to late stage. Um, and people were looking to fund phase three trials. They weren't interested in funding preclinical phase one or phase two. There's now been a huge resurgence of interest in those early clinical, in that early clinical work, and a lot of money is flowing in there. Again, driven in part by the tremendous results that we've seen from the immunotherapy and gene therapy companies. Um, Pre-money valuations, because of all this money flowing in the field, there's been a lot more <clears throat> competition for deals, and as a result, uh, pre-money valuations have risen pretty dramatically. Um, the bad news here is that it is still very, very difficult to raise money if you are a first-time company without an established relationship with a venture fund. It is really hard to get an audience with a venture fund if you are out there for the very first time raising money. Uh, most of the financings have been later stage or established deals with companies, you know, companies on Sand Hill, the guys that I see all the time. Um, they're funding the companies that are in their portfolio or the guys that come out of the company in their portfolio that they've already funded in the past. 
But if you're fresh to the market, you've got a new team and a new technology, and you're out there beating on doors, I see a lot of people nodding their heads, you guys have probably been through this, it is very hard. Now, we did have a very good quarter, uh, first quarter of this year, and the second quarter of this year. There's a big uptick in first-time financings, but we're retreating back to the norm in the third quarter. The PwC NVC data showed a 32% decline in first-time financings in uh, the third quarter of this year. So the bottom line is a lot of venture money coming in, still hard to get money if you are a first-time fund. Got some graphics and data that I'll share with you. The slides are gonna be available, but you can see from this chart, uh, look at the bars on the last uh, 2014 side, you can see a significant increase um, in VC investments in biotech. Um, and again, this dramatically demonstrates the extent to which early stage has now become something people are willing to fund, and they weren't. Venture guys just weren't interested in funding early stage technologies from 2000 through 2012. So this is very, very good news. We now need just to bridge that last gap and get uh, a little more interest from the established venture community with first time financings. Um, this is a graphic that shows that, that valuations have gone up. Uh, the red line is the NBI. I showed you that chart earlier. Um, and uh, you can see that valuations at every stage, Series A, B, C, and D, even at the IPO, have all tracked up, but not as dramatically as the, as the, uh, the NBI. Now, what does that tell you if you're an investor? And it tells you you want to get in if your company is going to go public, and if you are just going to make investments in the field, um, and you're not interested in growing technologies, building relationships, trying to nurture the field, if you're purely interested in financial return, you're probably playing more in the public markets than you are in the private markets, because you're seeing a more dramatic uptick in valuations as you go through. I mean, look at the curve starting in 2012. Where would you want your money to be deployed? Yeah, that's a pretty easy answer, right? You want to be in the public markets, not necessarily in the private markets. Now, you know, if there are a lot of, we can talk about that. That's just one judgment. Some data on first-time financings, I don't want to belabor that since we have a limited amount of time, but there, this data will all be available to you. It uh, demonstrates pretty clearly that first-time financings are still very low, driven in part by the fact that a lot of the early-stage venture funds went out of business. Uh, in the 2007-8, it started in 2000 with the collapse back in those days, but driven uh, more aggressively in 2007 and 8, uh, we lost a bunch of firms that were doing early stage investing, um, and uh, we'll see if that comes back. Some early stage firms are being formed. Um, right now, I think the mantra amongst uh, most venture guys in biotech is capital efficiency. Um, you've got to try to do more with less. You try, want to build virtual companies, uh, virtual teams, outsource as much as you can. Um, it's a different model than the model on which biotech was built, and I think it is the model for going forward in the future. Um, even in this environment where there are huge amounts of venture capital coming into the field, venture guys are not going to fund you to build your own lab and your own, not your own lab maybe, but not your own manufacturing facility, at least not until you're at a point where you know what it is you're going to manufacture. I mean, you can look across the field at, at failures in this field, and there have been many. And um, one of the things that you will find in a large majority of those failures are business decisions made to spend resources on building manufacturing facil facilities at a time when you didn't know what you were going to manufacture and you didn't really know what you needed in that facility, but you felt like you had to have that GMP facility or something like it. So you went out and built something, and then it didn't work. Um, Dendrian probably is a pretty good example of that, right? Um, there's a lesson to be learned there, and the venture guys have learned that very, very well, and so they are really funding capital efficient models, not models where you're building a mini J&J. Okay, last thing I want to just spend a second talking about uh, translation centers. I've talked about this before, and you can hear more about this elsewhere in the conference. <clears throat> translation centers, in my view, are one of the more positive things that's happened in the field. The emergence of these centers is places where you can go to, to develop your technology, to create value by moving your technology through the regulatory uh, regime on a very capital efficient basis. Um, these are centers that typically have um, good facilities, domain expertise, uh, teams that can help you. They typically have process development and cell manufacturing facilities. They're, they're tied into clinical trials networks. 
and uh, they can help you move your technology forward on a pretty capital efficient basis. I happen to work very closely with the CCRM in Toronto. Um, it's a translation center that was formed five years ago. I'm chairman of the board, um, and I think we're doing a great job there. We've taken the, the um, kind of learnings from the other 10 or 15 uh, translation centers that were established before we were built, took best practices and incorporated them into our model, uh, and we built out a pretty extensive network um, in Toronto. If you guys have not paid attention to what's happening in Ontario, this year alone there are only over $275 million was invested in Ontario infrastructure around regenerative medicines. Um, we are in the process right now of building a, a process development facility, a GMP facility. We have a clinical trials network there that's second to none. On average, they're doing 1,500 clinical trials at any given time uh, in Toronto itself. Um, and there is a very favorable regulatory environment. A lot of folks are talking about what's going on in Japan. Well, little known secret, or maybe it's the best kept secret in the field, Canada was the first country to approve a cell therapy. And they have a regulatory environment, although not as widely publicized, they have a regulatory environment that is akin to what's going on in Japan. So it happens on a more one-off basis in the Canadian way, um, but uh, it is a favorable regulatory environment, and of course there's tremendous academic institutions there. So if you haven't uh, um, noticed what's happening in Toronto, I would recommend that you take a look at it. And I think with that I'm going to stop and let uh, Jane and Chris uh, uh, talk to you about some of the other issues. We'll have time for questions at the end, so uh, why don't I let Jane come up and talk to you, and then we'll do some questions uh, as soon as Jane, as soon as Chris is done. Thank you. Let me get back to this laptop there. Okay, I'm Jane Andrews, and I'm a senior consultant with Frost and Sullivan, and Greg had asked me to kind of just go over a little bit about my background. And um, I spent the first, oh, 20 to 25 years of my scientific life um, being a scientist in the area of sperm egg interaction and early embryo development, the ultimate stem cells. And um, during that time, my, my major professor was one of the, the people that developed the culture media for Louise Brown, the first IVF baby. So believe me, I spent many years working with chemically defined culture media in the absence of serum. So I'm quite familiar with some of the challenges that you're facing in the industry. So after 20, 25 years in that area, I uh, am a scientist that went rogue. And um, I became a businesswoman, an entrepreneur first, businesswoman. And now I'm a senior consultant with Frost and Sullivan, where I walk the line between science and business. And Frost and Sullivan uh, has a number of different offices, 40 offices in 30 countries around the world. We have over 2,000 consultants and over 250,000 clients. We over, have over 50 products that we offer our clients, and we help them in all different areas of business development, all the way from the FACT Foundation. We help them discover uh, where their technology fits in with the technology in the world, where their opportunities are, where their market barriers are, and help them build their strategic plans and then implement those in their business model for growth. So I'm what they call a growth consultant in the business. Um, in the area of regenerative medicine, we have a number of clients in different uh, levels. Uh, we have all the way from large pharmaceutical companies, mid-size biotech companies, down to startups. And, ah, oh, there's a microphone. <laughs> and um, so, we, for example, the first company, uh, a global pharmaceutical company, we're helping them because they see a lot of investment in the regenerative medicine space right now. Uh, they see uh, their... Uh, competitors investing and they want to know where they should invest. So we're helping them 
look at the pipeline and where products are in regenerative medicine that would align with their corporate strategies and strengths internally. So once we help them with that fact foundation, we can then help them build a business strategy to take advantage of their internal uh, capabilities and align that with regenerative medicine. So that's one of the things we do there. We work with smaller companies um, to help them with look at the global market, uh, growth estimates, uh, strategic options, and we also are working with the manufacturing facility to help them with their build-out strategies. So um, where are the opportunities in regenerative medicine? Um, as most of you know, um, many of the treatments out there right now in, in healthcare are palliative. They don't actually cure the disease. They um, help control symptoms and they help control the disease, but there's very few real curative uh, uh, technologies out there right now. Regenerative medicine uh, looks like it may have um, some ability to be curative. Uh, in addition, we have what I call the silver tsunami. Um, the world's population is older now. Uh, in fact, in Japan, we have about 25% of the population that's over the age of 65. Globally, right now, we have more people over the age of 65 than five years of age. And within 15 years, that'll be more people over 65 than 10 years of age. In the U.S., by 2030, we'll have 19% of the population over 65. In countries that have socialized medicine, this is a, a very a big concern because they have to pay for health care for older people. And they want to reduce the cost because that can bankrupt countries. So uh, there's a lot of interest in keeping people healthier longer to reduce the cost of health care. That's one of the drivers uh, in this industry. Um, we can look at... Uh, uh, there are a number of different uh, um, rising costs, as I just mentioned, and uh, stem cell therapy may be uh, advantageous for use in, in the aging population. Um, I'll just sort of go over this briefly because Greg followed it, uh, uh, covered it very well. Uh, the industry is rapidly growing. It's got a CAGR of 23.2%, and it's forecast to reach $67.5 billion in 2020. Uh, as Greg said, there's over 700 regenerative medicine companies, um, and uh, some of those are private and some are public. Uh, the revenue is growing very rapidly. Uh, as you can see, there are the statistics up through 2014. Now, when we look at this uh, on an industry sector level, we can see that 40% of the, the regenerative medicine industry is in therapeutics followed very, uh, by 33% in cell and tissue banks. Uh, then third comes in uh, reagent companies and service companies. And if we look specifically at the therapeutic companies, uh, when we look at that segment, that's divided into four different areas with stem cell and progenitor cell-based therapies leading, followed by gene therapy, uh, and then thirdly, primary cell-based therapy and immunotherapies. Now, I think you're going to see this all changing in the future as we have the interaction of cell gene and stem cell gene therapy moving forward. All of these segments will change, I think, within the next three years. So uh, if we look at the products that are currently available um, by indication that are available on the market, the large majority of them are in the area of dermatology because those are some of the first ones that work their way through the pipeline. So they're on the market now. You see very little in cardiovascular or oncology. Uh, most of those are still in the pipeline. And I know this is a very busy slide and very difficult for you to see, but this is one of the things we do for technologies as we move forward. And if you just look at the sections of the pie, you can see that we have cardiovascular and oncology uh, with a lot of companies in those sectors. When we created this slide, and some of the things we're doing now is, Greg had said there's over 4,000 um, hits when you go to cl clinicaltrials.gov. We try and break that down and just click on the little box that says industry only rather than academia. So we, we hope to focus more in on industry rather than the broad spectrum of stem cell therapy. And so we have a lot fewer companies in these stages based on industry only. Um, and we look from the outside of the pie to the inside. I just cut it off at phase two here rather than including phase one because it was just too much to see. 
um, cardiology or cardiovascular is leading, then oncology, and I couldn't fit it all on one slide, so uh, we went on and looked at neurology and orthopedics as well, and uh, immunoinflammatory um, products and ophthalmology. So some of the companies we felt were growing included Mesoblast, um, and uh, we say that because they're in partnership with Teva, uh, JCR, Salgene, and Lanza. It's the last one on that slide. And um, they're looking at allogeneic products, which, uh, as many of you know, um, are really where the market is going, away from autologous to allogeneic. Um, Cellular Dynamics International was just purchased by Fujifilm. Fujifilm is becoming a big player in the market. Um, Cellular Dynamics uh, has a large, uh, a large bank, basically, of induced pluripotent stem cells. They're very supportive of their technology, and they developed a very good process that's repeatable. One of the most important things in uh, this market is repeatability and process and customer service. So we think that they're a very uh, interesting company. Um, Capricor Therapeutics, they're in partnership with Janssen and um, also looking at allogeneic products uh, using cardiospheres um, to look at uh, cures for myocardial infarction. Now, if we look at Big Pharma, even a year ago when I attended this meeting, there wasn't nearly as much interest from Big Pharma as there is now. And this is not only in stem cells, but also in cell gene therapies. Uh, examples here are Pfizer, that has their own internal unit now, uh, based, looking at uh, cell-based therapies for age-related macular degeneration. We have Pfizer, Novartis, and Salidas, which are trying to develop um, allogenetic, allogeneic um, CAR-T products. Very interesting approach. Um, Celgene has a 4.5% stake in mesoblast, and um, they're looking at acute graft versus host disease. Then we have Teva, which also is uh, invested in mesoblast, uh, looking at chronic congestive heart failure. And we have Johnson & Johnson that in 2014 uh, invested $12.5 million in Capricor and just recently have formed a partnership with Transposagen to look at gene editing and CAR-T technology. Now, just to, this slide just basically goes over what CAR-T technology is, and basically T cells are taken from a very ill patient. They're edited, gene edited in uh, vitro, uh, expanded, and put back in the patient. And this, uh, in some of the early stage clinical trials, has been very successful for the treatment of uh, leukemia and lymphoma, and uh, it is really pushing the market towards cell gene. In fact, Novartis is so interested, they're manufacturing CART T cells at their New Jer Jersey plant uh, that they purchased from Dendron. Uh, Kite is converting two leased plants for cell therapy. And Juno is testing CART T for treatment of uh, adult leukemia and non-Hodgkin's leukemia and they're also investing in manufacturing facilities. So let's move on to manufacturing facilities. As Greg had said, some people start their CGMP facilities not really knowing what they're gonna need them for in the end. And this is a very key, uh, uh, I would call it a rate determining factor in regenerative medicine is manufacturing. So if we look at autologous versus allogeneic. As most of you know, um, autologous is putting it right back into the patient. Um, allogeneic is taking cells from numerous people, uh, making a product that can be used across patients to treat many patients. So there's a real difference in the cost of goods sold with both of those uh, types of approaches. Um, number one, your cost of goods sold per patient is very high because you're basically creating one product per patient. Um, and it takes a number of weeks, two to three weeks, or maybe even longer, to get that patient's cells uh, uh, transformed and expanded. So that patient could be very ill and has to wait for those cells. Um, 
you really are, uh, the one really good thing about autologous is there's very little rejection uh, because you're taking it from the patient and putting it back into the patient. Um, and, and a rate limiting factor here is it's very hard to scale up because you're basically creating one product per patient. You need a CGMP facility or room that's specifically for that. And so you almost need separate CGMP facilities per patient if you're going to do this on an industrial level. Um, that is rather rate limiting and costly. Uh, so your um, profit margins are going to be relatively small in the area of 10% um, when you're trying to do this, uh, unless you really jack up the price to the patient. Uh, you can then get higher profit margins. Uh, if you look at allogeneic, uh, cost per patient is lower because you're creating one product for many patients. Um, you, you're treating multiple patients. The product is available immediately because it's already been produced. And um, then you, the, the barrier here is the, the rejection issue. So that is where the science is. That's what people are trying to get through uh, converting now to allogeneic products. And that would be, I think, somewhere between five years or so down the road. Um, the technology is more in the allogeneic area or the autologous area rather than the allogeneic. So if you're going to be a manufacturer of stem cells, what, is it, what are the things that you need to con consider the most? I think the most important thing is your team. That's always the, the case in business. It's always your team. You have to have the right people on board to do what you need to do that can work together. Um, secondly is a very strong quality management system that is universal through your facility that's automated to reduce costs of your overhead. Um, otherwise, your uh, quality management system can break you. Um, separation of activities. If you're going to do stem cell therapy and you're going to do cell gene therapy, you're going to have to create vectors and you're going to have to have molecular biology and you're going to have to have stem cell expansion or cell expansion. Those are different activities with different CGMP requirements. So you have to think about that as you're creating your CGMP facility and moving forward. Um, future considerations, um, you have to look at what's going to be needed three to five years down the road. What kind of facility are you going to need? Otherwise, you're going to be rebuilding. And that's exceptionally costly. Or you're going to have to move, which is very costly as well. And, and then again, if you're a CMO, your concern is making sure that your customer's intellectual property is protected. So I've worked with many companies over the years in many different areas of science, life science. And one of the things I feel very strongly about is making sure you have that reverse engineering approach. I mean, you know, you're a scientist at the bench and you think, I've got it. You know, I've got the science down. But so I'm going to make this a product. Well, you have to think about a lot of other things as in sort of a reverse engineering. Do you have a team that can do it? Again, I think one of the most important things. Um, what is your product going to be? Is it going to be autologous? Is it going to be allogeneic? Is it going to be in a nice shiny wrapper that's on the shelf outside the surgical suite? Is it going to be in a cold pack? Uh, is it going to be something that you have to uh, transport right before it's needed? Is it going to be in liquid nitrogen? What is it and what is your client base for that product? What is the process? A very important. You're sitting there in the lab, you think you've got cells in a petri dish or a flask. Well, if you're going to commercialize, what are you going to need? Are you going to need a bioreactor? Are you going to need a matrix? Are you going to need a completely closed, sterile system? What are you going to need as you move forward? And you want to develop that process and make sure that your CGMP facility can support that process. Which comes to the next point, where will you be doing this? Are you going to be trying to do this in your laboratory and creating your own CGMP facility? Um, well, that, can, that may work now, but it may not work later. So you have to think about where you're going to do this long-term development all the way through your stage one or stage two up through stage three and commercialization. Because if you get halfway through it and you have to change your process, you've got to revalidate and verify that with the FDA. And if you have to move it to another facility, you have to do the same thing. You have to revalidate and verify. So you want to make sure that the facility that you check or you bill or that you, that you uh, lease or you build or the CMO that you're working with has what you're going to need for a number of years as you develop this product. Um, and then 
you know, this gets closer to the science. You have to consider the safety along, you know, right after you look at the science and say, by golly, I've got it there. Uh, but all these things need to be thought about in the very early stages as you start developing your product. So in summary, um, market drivers and restraints. Uh, the aging population is a driver. The cost of health care is another driver. Um, new evidence that uh, Chris will be going over, uh, that stem cell has opportunity and cell gene now as we move forward. And evidence that um, the increase in number of late stage trials, as you saw uh, in my pie charts, uh, there's a lot more late stage trials in this area than there was before and as, as Greg had mentioned as well. Restraints are the lack of early stage funding um, and uh, inherent variability in cell culture. All of us who have done any cell culture at all know that working with living cells is the variability. And then something I didn't mention is validating and verifying that uh, the product you think you have is the product you really have. So developing assays that can really test the viability of, of what you've got. Um, and then uh, the undefined uh, federal regulations, and uh, Chris is going to touch on that uh, in the next talk. Uh, and then uh, high patient treatment costs. Uh, very high at this point, they'll come down when we go to allogeneic, they'll come down even more when we start to develop standards of care that get the correct codes for reimbursement. Um, where we think the market is moving, we th think it will be continuing to grow on a private and a public level. Um, there will be a lot of cross-segment integration of technology. You'll get immunology, molecular biology, cell culture, physiology, biology, all integrating to, as these products move forward. Very exciting time and a very exciting market. Um, legislative policies will develop that become supportive of the industry. And um, pharmaceutical and bio, uh, biomedical companies like Johnson and other big pharma will become more interested invest more, uh, which will lead to another shift in the market uh, as we move forward. So having said that, uh, you can basically read the slide here, and uh, I think I'll just close there. Thank you very much.